This video is brought to you by Skillshare. This is the Super Tacumer 50 millimeter. It's a radioactive lens. Now I know the term radioactive is a dangerous sounding word and rightfully so. In this video, we'll show the history behind these lenses, why they're radioactive, and if they're harmful for you. And the most important question, is the footage from it good enough to risk exposure for? Well, that's not great, but it's not horrifying. While we wait for this Geiger counter to finish calculating how much radiation we're being exposed to currently, let's talk about today's sponsor, Skillshare. The life of a creative can be super challenging, especially when it comes time to finding time to learn and discover new areas in your craft or broaden what you can do. But for me, with constant flights, travel, deadline, and weekly content creation, it can be hard to find quality resources that you won't waste your already limited time on trying to find. This makes Skillshare the perfect place to start if you're looking to perfect a skill or you're wanting to discover a skill that you didn't even know about. For me, as more of a video editor and producer, I've been trying to learn more about cinematic lighting is that it's not really a strong suit of mine. And I was able to learn a lot from joining a class Zach Mulligan put together on lighting techniques, really digging deep in how to use lighting to help tell a story in the video or film you're making. It's quality content like this that can be really hard to locate other places online. And Skillshare has given us the opportunity to be able to share this with you. The first thousand people to use the link in the description below will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. I really encourage you to check that out. Radioactive lenses have an interesting history, not shockingly getting their debut in 1945 at the end of World War II. Paul Palis of Eastman Kodak, yeah, that Kodak company, would file a US patent for optical glass. This patent would involve inserting thorium, a radioactive material that we will talk about here in a second, into the glass of the lens. Kodak would go on to develop the first of these lenses as aerial surveillance lenses, the Aero Ector. This lens was massive and is still used today by some adventurous photographers. But after this, other manufacturers would jump on the bandwagon of radioactive lenses with Canon, Kanika, and Pentax, also making thoriated lenses from 1945 to 1980. Typically, these companies would reserve using thoriated lenses for their more expensive lens offerings that were also the fastest lenses they had around f1.2 to f1.4. But what exactly is the benefit of these lenses being radioactive and having thorium infused into it? Well, it has to do with low dispersion. Low Low dispersion glass is specifically formulated and contains rare earth compounds that greatly reduce chromatic aberration. Chromatic aberration occurs when the wavelengths for different colors of light do not converge on the same focal plane. The result of lenses with a low dispersion is sharper images with better contrast since the fringes are no longer present. This brings us to the compound thorium oxide they introduced to the glass of the lens and is the source of the radiation in the lens. Thorium is a crystalline that was discovered back in 1828 by Swedish chemist Johns Jacob Berzelius. And interestingly enough, 60 years ago, the US actually could have chosen to use thorium instead of uranium as a power source as thorium is actually three to four more times more abundant than uranium but also it's cleaner and has a safer byproduct and is said to be much more powerful than uranium. But the US military was not all that interested in a safe byproduct. They wanted to use uranium and plutonium because of its dangerous byproduct, which I'm sure you've guessed at this point is used to make nuclear weapons. Go figure the government bypasses a cleaner, safer, and better power source just so they could make weapons. But besides being a great energy source, thorium actually has some great advantages for making lenses with it. It helps reduce chromatic aberration with within the lenses like we talked about before, which allowed them to make lenses with lower curvature, also making them smaller, which again made them much cheaper to make during this time period. With the radioactive material inside these lenses, the glass has been known to brown over time like this lens that I have. You can reduce browning with UV light or by exposing the lens to the sun for several days or certain LED lights, supposedly. Now you might be wondering, is this lens harmful to even touch or use as a photographer or a videographer? Typical radiation levels with lenses like this can reach around 10 millirems per hour, and it's this high right at the glass level. And millirem is actually a unit of absorbed radiation dose, if you were wondering. So for reference, chest x-rays expose you to about 10 millirems and dental x-rays to about 10 to 40 millirems. But what's the limit of exposure that a human body can take? Well, I found from the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission's website that oddly has a black magic 
Magic Pocket Cinema camera on its website. Coincidence, uh, very interesting. But according to the report for members of the public, you can be exposed to less than two millirems in any one hour from external radiation sources and less than 100 millirems in a calendar year. But you might be wondering, well, it says that you're getting 10 millirems per hour from this glass, but you really have no worries here. As a study done by KTH Engineering Sciences at Stockholm, Sweden, titled An Analysis of Residual Radiation in Thoriated Camera Lenses, determined that a typical thoriated lens would only expose you to about 0.2% yearly allowable exposure to the eye and about 0.17% allowable exposure to the rest of your body. The interesting thing here is that on average, x-rays only take about 15 minutes. And if you're a photographer, you could have this up to your eye for a bit longer than 15 minutes. So not sure how the math works here as I'm not a nuclear physicist, but from what I've read online, the general thought is just to not leave it on your camera for days as there's speculation that it could hurt your camera sensor. And also for your protection, don't scratch the lens or try to bust it open as most of the radiation is contained within the lens and you really are not much at risk. Even if you break it or scratch it, they just say, don't try to breathe in any of the dust or ingest it and you should be good. It's also suggested on their website that you don't sleep with it under your pillow at night because, you know, that's something us photographers and video people do just sleep with lenses under our pillows. And if you're wondering why no one makes these lenses anymore, well, in the 70s and 80s, people were really starting to be extra concerned with terms like radioactive material, and they ended up developing new lens technology to take its place, effectively abandoning them for good. You feel alive, let's hit the dance floor. Don't work too hard, my break a backbone. Covid and cash, I never like those. But I know the burning question now is, thanks for the nerd talk, but does this lens actually look good when you put it on a camera? Well, let's take a look at this specific lens that I have, the 50 millimeter Super Takuma, and then some real world tests of the lens. But first, let's talk about some scientific looks at this. How bad was the actual browning of this lens that we talked about? The first thing I really wanted to test was how much it actually did affect the white balance of the image. So I set the white balance to what I would usually use under any normal circumstance with the Aperture 120D in a studio environment, used a light meter to check and make sure that it was adjusted accordingly, and then got this image from it. Going back in post, I had to cool off the image by about 1600 Kelvin to get it close to fairly balanced levels. And I'm glad that I actually tested this in a studio environment first because it can actually be somewhat difficult to tell that it's off by this much when you're just filming outside. As far as the focused test for this lens, this it actually stayed sharply focused from the center to the corners with just a slight drop off in sharpness the further you went out, which you can see here. Overall, with several tests, this lens performed much better than I expected it to, maintaining mostly consistent focus across the image. Other than that, there's a decent amount of focus breathing with this lens, which you really notice a lot more up close. And as far as lens halation, I'm not seeing much of it in the test chart here. And you're wondering what lens halation is. It's when the brighter part of the image will spill over into the darker part of the image, kind of a hazy looking effect. For vignetting, not much vignetting with this lens. And lastly, the thing I expected to see the least of was chromatic aberrations from this lens, as we talked about the benefits of thorium and how it can counteract chromatic aberrations aberrations, but you can definitely see chromatic aberrations in some of these lines on several of our test charts, which to be fair, it's pretty minimal but it's still there and do seem to affect the color and specific parts of the image. But all in all, I wouldn't say it's terrible levels of chromatic aberration. So now for the actual real world tests of this. I had thought about potentially flying to a location to film with this lens until I read a story about a guy who packed one of these lenses and checked luggage. And then upon arrival at his destination was quickly brought into a high security room where they took apart the lens to figure out what the source of the radiation they picked up was. And uh, yeah, he got to take home pieces of his lens. So I just stuck to places I could drive to. I decided to use this lens in two very different locations, one in the mountains with some darker, cloudier weather, and then at the beach at sunset to test the lens and how it responded to more extreme contrasts. So for the sunset on the beach, I found that I liked how it looked more when I was not pointing the camera towards the sun. Whenever I did, I just didn't get very pleasing looking flares or even a nice looking sun, no matter how dark or bright I exposed the camera. It just kind of came out like a blob of light that, again, didn't look very pleasing. Part of me wonders if this is due to to the actual browning of the lens again, and if it affected the light coming in. Though I haven't found any evidence online that that's the issue, just how the lens normally takes it in. Now for the mountain test shots, I actually really like this lens for some of the moodier, darker shots that I was able to get. It had a really nice look to it in these conditions, which in some of the shots from the beach, away from the sun, I thought it turned out fairly similarly to these shots. All in all for a lens that I got for $60 on eBay, and that's about 
you know, 50 or 60 years old. It's not bad. I've actually used it a couple of times for shoots with clients and on other projects as it's really, really small and light. It has a nice look to it for specific shots. So if you ended up wanting to use this lens, don't sleep with this again under your pillow and you should be just fine. And if you're a camera nerd like the rest of us on this channel and you like some random camera history, check out this $250,000 cinema camera that Sony tried to sell back in 2008.